This episode is presented by Northern Kitchen on Main Street in Wapaka. Welcome back to another episode of Pod Paca. Today is a very exciting episode, especially for Wapaka area residents, because today we are going to talk to the Wapaka City Administrator, Aaron Jensen. We are going to talk not only about how he got to the point where he is today, but we are also going to talk about the future of the city of Wapaka and all of the great questions and responses you had in the poll that we released. If you follow us on Facebook or Instagram, you saw the poll, you saw it get released. And if you didn't see it, then that's a good reason to follow us on social media because you could influence what we talk about on future Podpack episodes. So make sure to follow us on Facebook and Instagram. But now, before we talk about the poll, I want to know more about our special guest today. Please welcome Wapaka City Administrator, Aaron Jensen. How are you doing today, Aaron? I'm great, Joe. Thanks for having me. Hey, Aaron. Hey, Tim. So did you ever expect that you would become the city administrator of Wapaka? No, <laughs> not even a little. Uh, no, no, I, but I did grow up here and it was an awesome place to grow up. So, and I feel incredibly fortunate to be working in the capacity that I am in the town uh, that I grew up in or the city I grew up in. I'm surrounded by my family. My kids get to be surrounded by my their grandparents and my grandparents, their great grandparents. I think we kind of joke related to most of the county and most of Iola and Scandinavia or a bunch of Norwegians. So uh, kind of have that that part of the county covered. So uh, city politics never came to mind in high school or right after high school is something you wanted to do. And if it didn't, what did you originally want to do? No, it didn't. Um, you know, I, it actually probably started. It's funny how it got started, but it was related yet very unrelated at the same time when I was in high school. Me and my brothers were in a lot of sports. Um, one of the job opportunities at the time when I was in high school was working for the city parks and recreation department. So we were on a uh, grounds crew and we would prep ball fields. Uh, we would mow grass and all of those things that you see our seasonal guys in the parks doing right now. Got into umpiring, refereeing, basketball, things like that. And then that actually, we did that for, man, I probably worked at the park and rec department here in Wapaka for four or five years, maybe more. And it was a ton of fun. And then they, that job and that job did and still does. The reason it was great is that they were flexible with some of our other things that we do as kids, right? So if you are in basketball or baseball or uh, have other activities going on, they kind of work around that schedule. And actually my boss then uh, is still the boss of those seasonal positions today. I actually carried that over into lacrosse. I went to the University of Wisconsin lacrosse after high school and graduated from there with a recreation management major. Uh, during my four years at lacrosse, I also worked for the lacrosse park and rec, did a lot of the same type of things, helped with some event management, um, coached youth, uh, refereed, umpired, all of that fun stuff with the intent of getting into the park and recreation industry, uh, which I did. Actually, one day after graduation, there just happened to be a recreation coordinator position open for the city of Wapaka. So uh, the day after graduation, we started that. It was actually an internship, which turned into a, a job, uh, was the rec coordinator for two years. Uh, and then became the park and recreation director for five years, I believe it was. And then had an, uh, kind of an unexpected opportunity come up, uh, went over to the school district and was the activities director or athletic director uh, for both the middle school and the high school uh, for about two years. Had great experiences over there. And then this opportunity for the city administrator uh, opened up and, and here I am. And it's been four years, but it should be noted that I was also uh, attending. Actually, I started attending classes to get my master's in public administration, even prior to going to the school district. I did that when I was uh, a park and recreation director. Uh, the city actually supported that uh, to some level as well. And 
it was a windy road, but that's how I got here. Is there is there a lot of difference between city administrator and some of the other other Wapaka positions you held? Uh, yeah, I think there is and there isn't, right? I mean, I think I, I'm still on a daily basis working with some of those things, especially in the park and recreation field, working with our parks and rec director and that department on quality of life stuff. There's just things that I'm working on or with now that I never, you know, I never would have in that position, whether it be development, whether it be city council staff relations, whether it be licensing or the finances within the city. Um, so similar, Tim, but but very different at the same time. You'd probably be dealing with a lot of the same people. Yeah, uh, that's true, which is awesome. Um, I think we're super fortunate to be surrounded by a lot of really good people. You know, when you're in like the parks and recreation field or the athletic director position, you know, you're working with people that want to give their time to, in that instance, the youth or events or volunteer days on the trail or anything like that. And they're community minded people. And I certainly still am dealing with many, many community minding, minded people, which makes this position and those positions uh, rewarding and enjoyable. Something that Mayor Smith talked about on a pod pack episode he was on was that if you wanted to become mayor, a good way was to become really involved with city council meetings and to be on the city council. Would you say that is similar for being a city administrator or would you recommend uh, some other routes if someone wanted to become a city administrator in their town? I, yeah, I think I would. I think that's, and he's spot on. I think getting involved in city council from an elected official standpoint, or if you have aspirations to be mayor, you know, getting involved first on those committee levels and then city council and working your way up, just so you have an understanding of how overall city or municipal governance works, makes a ton of sense. And that is not different for the city administrator. Now there's other things, typically there's education requirements that are needed and things like that for this position. So, you know, it's, it's different, but I, I would absolutely, that'd be a great suggestion to have people get involved in city council if you ever thought you'd want to be an administrator. Actually, there are, I know there, I have colleagues that are either city administrators or city managers that were previously, you know, they might've become the administrator for, this isn't the town that, but like, let's say Hortonville, and maybe they were previously a council member in the city of Appleton. So it translates pretty well. Um, and I think going back to kind of, since we're going to talk about the mayor and our city council, if that's where it starts, because that those are my 10 bosses plus one, the mayor who I work most closely with. Um, and he's been here for, we were just talking about it. Uh, oh my gosh, it's like 30 years. So just having that level of expertise and there's not many things that he hasn't seen. And we have a lot of council members that have been there a long time too. And, and it really does give you a sense of stability and uh, trust, which is awesome. Well, I, I personally have a great deal of respect for Brian. Mm -hmm. Yeah, he's, he's fantastic. Yeah, uh, to be able to uh, do what he's done for so long is it, it actually, it's amazing. I think we talked, didn't he say he was only going to do it a couple of years, Joe? And now it's been over 20. Yeah, so. <laughs> <laughs> it's only supposed to be a temporary uh, thing for him, but guess yeah. not. It's funny, yeah. we're doing a leadership series right now with some of our staff, whether they be department heads or aspiring leaders in the organization. And, and yeah, we asked him and he agreed kind of at the end of the series, at the end of this year, he's going to come in and talk about leading through longevity because we have... There's so many people now, Joe, in kind of our uh, generation, you know, I think people tend to want to see instant success or instant gratification. And yeah. a lot of the things that are worthwhile take a lot of time. <laughs> and the ability to stick with something through ups and downs and not everything, when you're with something for that long, not everything is feels awesome and is perfect. And the perseverance to kind of grit some of that stuff out is, it's a pretty good trait that a lot of people can learn from, so. 
Yeah, I think you're right. And Joe and I were talking about that the other day, you know, all the instant gratification everybody wants. And they, I don't think people understand the whole brick and mortar attitude as much mm -hmm. as they should. Right. Uh, right. Can you explain what that is quick? Brick, brick and, and mortar, mortar attitude? Some people might not know. Basically, you need, you know, there's the short approach to things, but that needs to be accounted for with the long game if that makes sense. You know, it's not what can you do from a good example would be the, the Halloween thing we do in town. It's the way I see it. This is how I see it. You have a day where you've got, it's a wonderful event, by the way, thousands of, of trick-or-treaters and being a store owner, you know, I'm handing out what, two, 3,000 pieces of candy or whatever. Um, the point is for everyone to have a good time, not necessarily come in the stores because we're wanting to promote our city as a whole. It's almost like advertising in a sense. You're thinking these people will come back later that have never been to downtown Wapak or they're coming for trick-or-treating with the kids. And they look around and go, wow, I need to come back here and enjoy a day here. To me, that's that's kind of a a long-term thing. You know, I'm not maybe maybe I'm not getting any real benefit that day, but how many of these families are going to come back later and just visit the town and go spend money in the restaurants, the shops, or just enjoy it? If you know, and it, it's it it's a build up too. You know, we've only had two years of that particular event. Think of what that's going to be like in five or six years. Look at how popular it's gotten. You know, that that's what I'm trying to say. It's it's all a you know, the snowball effect, the brick and mortar effect. And that's just a small part of everything as well. I don't know if I explained it very well, but. That's a great point. That person may come into your store once that day and maybe it results in $15 worth of sales. But if they had never been to a pack, if, if that event made them feel a certain way, like they wanted to come back, they, over the next 10 years, they may come back 50 times, right? Yeah. And they may, bring, you know, who knows, they may bring a pack of friends with them. I mean, right. you know, that's what we want. We want people to enjoy the downtown. I mean, it's, it's, it's an amazing downtown, but you know, all this stuff just adds up, Joe. And I came into, to it with the attitude in the beginning that I wasn't competing against anyone. It was more, you need to work with them to build the popularity of the area. Because once you do that, everybody wins. But it takes time. That's what I mean by brick and mortar. This could take years. You know, it could take 5, 10, 15, 20 years. So, yeah, kind of the point of it. You know, that's why I'm in retail, because it's not an instant gratification <laughs> at all. So. And I guess you could relate that to the city. We'll talk about this with the poll. But, you know, you, you just recently redid Main Street. And uh, the mayor told us a little bit that you... Uh, we're cons we're going to work on Churchill and Fulton potentially and other parts of the town. So doing mm -hmm. one piece at a time helps make everyone go to all parts of the town, not just Main Street. Yeah, absolutely. And we we feel like downtown is a huge asset and it's unique and it's historic and it's um, we have a, a collection of awesome uh, businesses and in different sectors that make it a special place. But yeah, we have, we have we think we have awesome parts of our town all over the place, and we have to we focus on those as well. Right now, as you mentioned, Joe, we're going through this summer. We're going to be going through uh, a Churchill Street corridor uh, planning process, and actually, there people will see a public meeting kind of invitation, uh, open invitation probably sometime in late May for that, just to get some input, look at a first draft, kind of see where it takes us. And then also Fulton Street, we actually, our grant writer, which I'm sure you guys have talked about on the show before, because it's an amazing success, uh, applied for what's called a raise grant, which is a huge grant for both planning and then hopefully eventual construction of Fulton Street. Um, right now, the planning would focus on basically from the the Fulton Street and Main Street intersection up to about Hillcrest, which is where Hardy's is for reference for people. Um, and that would kind of be the first stretch that's looked at and, uh, and then hopefully extended west from there. But it's a competitive grant process with federal dollars. There's a lot of hoops to jump through. So we'll see what happens. 
before we get more into that, because I do want to dive into that, I do want to know more about your day, a day in the life of a city administrator. You talked about how you work with your 10 bosses of the city council and the mayor, uh, but can you walk us through a typical day as city administrator? Yeah, so I'm going to start with the personal stuff, right? I have two little kids, so we start by getting them ready for school. Uh, one's at eight and one's six. And yeah, typically get to work at about seven, seven fifteen, seven thirty. And then my day is, so I heard from a really smart individual once actually. He used to be a resident here in the Wapaka area. Um, he was a, uh, actually a CEO of a large company uh, in the region. And he always said, Aaron, at the end of the day and at the end of the week, you know, there are things that you like to do with your job and there are things that kind of give you energy back and there are things that you don't necessarily like to do, but they're responsibilities of your job. And what he always did to be successful was to say, hey, I, at the end of the day or the end of the week, I will put a plus one or a plus or a minus one, depending on how I spent my time that day. If I broke it into eight hours, I might have eight of those up. And my goal is to be as close to zero as possible. So that means I have a good balance of doing the things that kind of give you energy in your job, but also you're not neglecting the things that maybe would be easy to put off. Luckily, I feel like I have a ton of things that give me energy in my job. And that's largely because of the people that I'm surrounded with. Um, and so many of our, the things that we work on, it's not me sitting behind my computer and coming up with ideas um, in a box. It's just, it's all collaborative in nature, right? So we always say the best ideas come from uh, usually almost never me, I can guarantee you that, but come from kind of collaborative conversation, whether it be with our staff or whether it be with residents or whether it be from input from residents that turn into conversations within our staff. But to get more detailed, I would say, you know, if I'm here for, you know, nine, 10 hours, I'm probably in meetings for four to five of those hours, if not more, if, um, a couple hours of unexpected conversations, typically two to three. Um, and then maybe, you know, a couple hours of work time uh, where I'm just getting my own administrative stuff done. And then usually we're moving on to like kids' piano lessons and baseball practice and basketball practice. And, and uh, when we hit the hay. Before we do talk about more city stuff with the poll that we did and stuff, is there any part of being a city administrator that people don't expect as part of your job? Uh, that's a good question. I mean, probably a lot. You know, I, I think probably a lot. And to say any specific part, I'm not sure if I could pinpoint anything, which I know is not a great answer. But I think in general, people just, you know, it's hard to understand the kind of the complexities or the things that have to happen on a day-to-day -day basis to make a city run. And those things are carried out by our staff. But I've heard from multiple city council members, um, and I think the mayor would tell you this too, if he didn't on your podcast, a lot of times people run for elected office because they don't agree with how things are going, right? So they're, they want to come in, they want to make a change. Yeah. And the mayor will tell you that he was that way too when he first got on, you know, a hundred years ago. Um, but he, he's like, man, I, you know, I'll tell you what, after a year, um, a full year of really being involved in those conversations at the council level and, and hearing from the department heads and the people that are working and gaining an understanding of how it works, it just, it's just different than what you think. And um, I've heard newer council members uh, not necessarily say that they came on for, because they wanted to change everything, but they're, they have a different understanding now of things than, than when they were new to it. So I don't know if that answers your question, but there's probably so many things that people uh, would be surprised are a part of the position. Yeah, pretty much anything that is going on in, within the city, you're somewhat involved in, I'm assuming, even the normal paperwork to 
you know, the craziest of things. Yeah, I mean, you think about it, it could be anything from having to do with, right, look, we'll look at all our departments. We have, you know, IT, community, community media, we have police, we have economic development, we have parks and recreation, we have library, um, we have wastewater treatment, we have water, uh, we have our streets, you know, we contract for EMS and fire service. Um, emergency management as part of it. So there's just so, if, if you just kind of brainstorm on all the things that could happen in any of those areas, um, it's a pretty broad, vast list. You never had experience like with a city administrator position before, had you? No, no, I was brand new. I was, I was green to the position when I took this job. Um, yeah, I just wonder how you've managed to, to make that transition it had to be a real eye opener at times, but yet yeah. you managed to take it very calmly. It might just be because you have a good demeanor, but were there times you, you know, were just sitting there confused, wondering? <laughs> or uh, uh, yeah, of course. So, I mean, the way that I handled the transition or the way that it worked or the reason it worked is because people around me probably had a lot of patience and they were very supportive. I look back at uh, things that I probably said during meetings or conversations or, or ideas I had or proposals I had in my first six months or a year or a year and a half, because it takes a long time to kind of figure this stuff out, like to the point where you feel really confident. And I'm like, oh my gosh, people must've been looking at me like this guy, <laughs> those are terrible ideas, right? Um, but luckily we did have people that, you know, whether it be my department heads that have been in the positions long enough to know exactly how to maybe guide me in the right direction at those times, or our mayor, like I said, who's been there for a long, long time. So, yeah, I think, you know, anytime anyone takes a new job, whether it's this job or anything else, I mean, there's a learning curve, right? And for people to be successful in those positions, like the people around them have to kind of be patient and supportive and I was lucky enough to step in a situation that was exactly that. So, Do you think that your experience as a high school quarterback and a football, like football is the main sport in Wapaka for high school sports. Quarterback is the, like the most looked at position in football. And do you think any of the pressure of being in a position that has a lot of people talking about about it help you be a better city administrator because they both are such leadership heavy positions uh that's a good question i've never been asked that ever um i will have to say joe since i'm a formal former activities director i have to say that like it's not the most important sport <laughs> all of our sports are awesome and important and do do great things for kids um but i did love football and uh i I don't, that's, that's a great question. I think so. I mean, right. Just from a, like a, like a relationship with, you know, with others standpoint, maybe, I mean, certainly didn't um, prepare me for the intricacies of being a city administrator, but it, yeah, I, I think that's what sports do. Right. I think that's what the value of, of, of sports are to youth and that's why I love being involved in my kids and I think it's so important because I always say like hey I got an education through traditional school right and I got a whole nother education through team activities and and I was also there at a time where I was super fortunate to be coached by some really impressive people so I got like an up close and personal four-year training from in football, if we're talking football, one of the best coaches to ever do it in the state. So not many people got that opportunity to be surrounded by that type of a personality. So from a, yeah, from, I think from a social relationship standpoint, it, it probably helped. I need to mention, I mean, that was uh, 2006 when you were the quarterback was the first year we, uh, what the Comets won a state title. We did. I know. It's funny. You, that was not a game to go to and watch if you were an offensive fan. Uh, the old seven to three score. I think we actually almost had the the lowest. 
I think there was one lower scoring game. We are pretty close to the lowest scoring state game in history, but our defense did what they needed to do and helped us out a whole bunch. Well, and you mentioned too, you were up against first uh, team in the state for three defensive positions on, on the other team. Yeah, it was crazy. They had uh, their defensive tack, either nose guard or defensive tackle was a first team all American. And then their middle linebacker was a first team all state player and their safety was a first team all state player. So they had, they had guys all over the place. It was, uh, <laughs> we didn't have a lot of answers. Let's put it that way. We can give a shout out too. I mean, you know, we're not, I want everybody to know we're not just plugging football. We've had some pretty, pretty darn good baseball teams here too. So. Oh yeah. We've had a lot of, uh, honestly, a lot of good baseball teams. We've had a lot of good players in a lot of sports. And I think actually one of our girls right now for volleyball just got uh, a division one um, offer to walk on, I think somewhere in New York, which is super exciting. That does not happen very often. Cool. Congrats uh, to her. Yeah. Yeah. Olivia Grawl. So. I think Wapaka, as far as athletics go, I think they've had six or seven state titles altogether which I think is impressive because this isn't the biggest town in the world. Yeah, no, it's really impressive. Does that include dance? Because dance has had a whole bunch too. Our dance, yeah, our dance team's phenomenal. Is, yeah, yeah. They're, they are really, really good. Um, they're, they're, yeah, super they're the, impressive. Yeah, arguably the pride of Alpaca, honestly. Yeah. Chain Skiers is another yeah. one. I mean, that's pretty amazing. Well, that's what's kind of cool, too, about WPAC is there's just so many things that kids can get involved in. Actually, like when I was in high school, there wasn't as many opportunities. And, and now, yeah, there's a, you got every opportunity that a lot of most of the Valley schools have, I would say, if not more. After this, we will talk about the poll that was sent out and talk about the future of WPACA and all of the ideas that came in for city improvement. So stay tuned. All right, we're back and we are now going to talk about the Wapaka improvement poll. Uh, we had over 60 people. We had 65 people sent in responses uh, that wanted to know their, uh, they wanted to know, blah, wow. <laughs> All right. Uh, we had over 65 people, or blah, I'm messing up, I'm sorry. Uh, we had 65 people send in responses to our poll. We asked very general questions about what you would like to see happen in Wapaka. And so we are going to go over them right now, and uh, we'll have all questions uh, answered by City Administrator Aaron Jensen here. So here we go. Uh, first, we did have a few questions about the people taking the poll themselves. So uh, I asked, how long have you lived in the Wapaka area? And 55% of people have been living here for over 20 years that uh, took this poll. And then it was a pretty good spread between 15 to 19, 10 to 14, 5 to 9, less than 5. Uh, it was pretty even for the rest of them. Age range, that was pretty even between uh, people that were 19 and 69. We only had one person over 70. We had no one 18 and under. So this is all adults answering this. The most was from 60 to 69 year olds uh, was 27%, but the rest was pretty even. And then 61% of people that took this poll were female and 39% were male. So let's get to the improvement questions. Uh, first question I asked was, where would you like to see the most upgrades and improvements in Wapaka? And we got a lot of responses, but 55% of people said Fulton Street. And I want to know from you, Aaron, what is going on with Fulton Street? I know we started talking about this earlier, but let's continue on with what the city is thinking with Fulton Street. Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, first, uh, that's that's interesting to me. And I, I would love to kind of dive into that a little deeper and see what they would like to see the improvements be or what they would like to see changed. Um, 
But as I was mentioning before, um, our grant writer recently did apply for a raise grant, and that is federal money in large portions, but very competitive as well. Uh, that would help us go through a planning and design phase uh, for actually he applied for all of Fulton Street, uh, going all the way out uh, to the very western edge of the city uh, into downtown. But the primer, that first phase would be a focus between uh, downtown and Hillcrest or by Hardee's. And, you know, we're just looking for um, improvements. So specifically in that area, you know, there might be opportunity for some pedestrian improvements along with traffic improvements and see how you can get those to work together, right? It's kind of a little, little bit of a weird uh, one and a half lane type scenario there. And what does, what kind of flushes itself out as far as opportunities in design? Um, I don't have the answers for that right now because we haven't started that process, but um, it is on Justin, our public works director. It's on kind of near the top of his list on the next biggest projects uh, after the public works facility, which is happening this summer and in the next year, and also uh, Elm Street which is getting looked at. So right near the top of our capital plan and in the next 12 to 15 months, we'll, we'll have probably a lot more direction. And uh, we did have someone, I had a other category. I gave four general options, which was Fulton, Churchill, East Side by Fleet Farm and the airport, and then Oak Street area, Northeast. But someone did say specifically, uh, there are many smaller streets that are not on main traffic routes that are in bad shape and have not had ex any extensive work on them since Fulton Street was redone. So that's related to Fulton Street as well and the smaller streets around it. Have you considered the smaller streets or is it too early in the process to ask about that? Yeah, so absolutely. When, when streets get selected, Part of the way they get prioritized is not only what you see and the condition above ground, but a lot of times there needs to be a lot of utility work. You know, the average resident or basically no residents probably understand what the state of the utilities are underground. So sewer, water, when do those need to be upgraded? And how do we kind of pair that with the, the condition of the road to say, okay, it's kind of time to do a complete rework in some of those areas? Obviously, other things that work into prioritizing is traffic flow, right? So the heaviest used um, areas typically get some attention uh, because the most car volume is going, traffic volume is going on them on a daily basis. And, and there's always like the limit of money, right? So we're actually really proud of the fact that we've been able to do a pretty major street project every year. Uh, a lot of communities, uh, a lot of municipalities around the state uh, aren't able to do that because of funding constraints. Um, and I could get into the whole kind of shared revenue and what's happened with that over the better course of 20, 25 years from the state, but I don't need to bore you with that. Uh, although it does look like there could be some changes coming this year, which will be awesome. But the reality is, is if we do a major road project a year, that's that's a very good thing. That also helps us if we... There's kind of a sweet spot, Joe. We let's say we we put about a 1.5 million dollars into capital projects each year. We want to always put about 500,000 to 750,000 dollars on average into street related projects uh, or road aid related projects because that helps us get money back. Uh, it's like an equation from the state. If we're can, if we're showing we're investing in those things to that level, that'll maximize the amount of state aid we get for the next budget year uh, for those things. So just to name a couple of the projects that have been done lately, obviously you guys know Main Street, everyone knows Main Street. Um, High and Hillcrest uh, were done this past year. I've already mentioned like looking forward, we're looking at Elm Street as the next one, although we do have that big public works facility as well that's gonna be going on starting actually within the month in May. Uh, and that'll be, you know, they'll probably be done in the spring or summer of 2024, ready to move in. So there's things going on, but like anything, you know, we'd love to be able to do all the streets today, yeah. <laughs> but yeah. uh, there are constraints to that. 
Um, I'll read off the rest here for that question, which once again was, where would you like to see the most upgrades and improvements in Wapaka? 14% was Churchill. 12% was the east side by Fleet Farm and the airport. And then 9% was the Oak Street area in northeast Wapaka. But we had plenty of other, which included County Q and more dedicated bike paths connecting King and Chain, North Street, Wisconsin Street, River Street, other Swan Park roads, Third Ward area. Someone said Main Street. <laughs> um, I actually know who put that down. They put it down as a joke to tease you. <laughs> but yeah, the, that was the uh, other responses. Um, are you surprised that Fulton Street has so much more to vote than Churchill Street or the east side? Um, I, okay. I guess probably not because it's, it again, when you look at traffic volume, it's that is one of our busiest streets. Actually, also, if you look at traffic data, um, crash data uh, that's kept, it, that's probably one of our most dangerous stretches. Just when you're pulling out, out of some of those side streets, kind of by Burger King or Starbucks and those areas, that, that is where the most traffic related um, incidents will pop up. Usually not, uh, not a lot of fatalities, which is good, but nevertheless, a lot of recordable incidents. So I think, I mean, I would agree with them, but that's probably the area that that is a, is a focus. Is that one of the reasons you want to repair Fulton because of the traffic and crashes? So it's interesting. It, you know, we are fortunate enough. If, if you look at that traffic data and you present it to the state or whatever it might be, we in Wapaka relatively do not have very many and like they would look at us and they'd be like, yeah, okay, that's the hot spot in your community for incidents. But in comparison to areas that we see as problem areas, it may not register. To answer your question, I think that's one of a number of things that I think we could improve in going through a design and planning process and reconstruction. So, okay. Um, and I'm going to move on to the next question here so we can fit everything in on time. Uh, this is, this will be a fun one. Uh, what which kind of businesses does the Wapaka area need the most? You say title companies was that number one? Uh, no, there wasn't title companies in there. Uh, but yep. the four uh, big ones I put down other um, and then I put an other option: restaurants, department stores, pharmacies, entertainment, and sports. Pharmacies only had three percent of the vote. So I don't think many people want pharmacies, more pharmacies. However, the other three were quite even. Huh. Entertainment and sports had 32.3%. And I put examples down like arcades, event venues, laser tag, pickleball courts, uh, stuff like that. And then department stores, 27.7% of the vote. And then restaurants had 23% of the vote. However, there was a lot of other that would be put into these categories. Uh, I know some people wanted something that had both restaurants and entertainment and sports in one. And a lot of people also said that they really want something that is after dinner where you can relax, like there's one that says business where you can have a night out with friends to create and relax uh, with possible wine cocktails, small plates, restaurants and entertainment. People said T-dubs replacement, stores open after six to 7 p.m., more activity options, uh, walking trails updated, big businesses that bring jobs and money to Apaca. Uh, specialty restaurants like pizza, but not like Domino's. Um, so like, I'm assuming they mean local restaurants, not like chains. Buffalo Wild Wings was on here, Walmart. Uh, so what's your, I know I just gave you a lot of info there, Aaron, but what's your reaction to all of that? 
Um, I am going to focus on kind of the what I think you explained is the top four, I believe. I know I heard uh, department stores, and I think that's not something I am surprised about at all. Obviously, with uh, you know Kmart recently closed a few years ago now, that was a hot topic of conversation, and and people brought up Walmart and why don't you get a Walmart or a Target or or whatever Kohl's or whatever it might be, and I think that's you know a lot of people understand kind of how that works. Some people don't, which um, which I'll just explain for a second, right? It's a lot of those types of stores have been leaving communities our size for a decade plus, but more recently with the rise of online shopping and all of that. And a lot of people do kind of have this assumption that the city can just go and kind of pluck a Walmart or a, a Target and say, hey, yeah, that's, you know, well, let's land them, let's do it, right? But the reality is, is that all these buildings are privately owned. There's a certain price that they're asking for them any data that we put together as a smaller municipality and present to a, a big corporation like Walmart or Target, well, they already have that data times, you know, 10. Um, and they know exactly where they want to be and where, where it makes sense for them to be and where it doesn't in relation to other stores and such. So that doesn't mean it's not worth effort and it doesn't mean it's not worth, you know, reaching out to places um, that might be desired by the community. But you know, there's probably a little more to it than, than most people re realize, which I don't blame them because they don't work in this every day, right? I think the other important thing to note is that, you know, even though we might not have a Walmart or a Target, it's, you know, if, if people can kind of walk around, drive around, go to the different places that we do have, there's a lot of, you know, you can get a lot of things here in Wapaka. Uh, you know, obviously everyday hometown is very similar um, in, in what it provides. Uh, which is in the old Shopco hometown, Main Street, right? Main Street has a collection of, of a lot of different retailers that you can get a lot of different things. Um, that's where I do, you know, if we have birthday parties that we're taking our kids to, we'll stop in to Main Street and that'll be the first spot we look and we always find something. Obviously, Fleet Farm on the east side of town is an option too. So, I mean, I get it. I, I totally, I, I, I understand the sentiment, but that's just a little explanation. I guess my thoughts on it. Entertainment and sports, that's interesting. And I think, yeah, especially in the winter, right? I mean, if you're not into like outdoor activities, winters can be long in Wisconsin and Michigan and Minnesota. We recently took up skiing because we were going a little mad. Um, but, and that's the other cool thing. Like as much as we love Wapaka for being the city of Wapaka, we are surrounded by a number of cool amenities, one being Iola, you know, the cross country ski trails up there. We've got Hartman's Creek, which has winter activities, state park right out our backyard, all of the lakes and geographical things that that um, provides. But as far as like businesses, yeah, that's, it's, it's a, a little bit of a similar story, right? There, we're a market of a certain size and anyone that is going to want to put some of those what you're seeing now is Appleton and they like the champion center um, and some, some big indoor venues like that, that people really love. They walk in and they're, they're like, man, this is awesome. And we've actually talked to developers, commercial developers about some of those things, because we've also heard that that's an interest. And I can tell you um, by trying to find gym space in the winter uh, for whatever it may be, it's hard to do. I mean, even though we have our rec center, which is beautiful, all the school buildings, they're packed, they're used all the time, which is awesome. But at the same time, I know those things are, are can be challenging to make work from a business model standpoint. What I get the impression from this question is that restaurants, department stores, and entertainment and sports, it seems like they're an even third of mm -hmm. this question as far as what people want. It kind of seems like there's no clear favorite like there was with Fulton Street and the other question. I'm going to throw an idea out here at you because I've not heard a lot of people talk about this, but you're doing a lot of housing on the east side. Mm -hmm. And once you do housing, you're probably going to want other businesses, right, on the east side by Fleet Farm and the airport. So would it be the worst idea in the world to maybe have some of these needs that people want not on Fulton and by the east side in this flat land. And it's pretty far away from Main Street as well. 
uh, mm -hmm. to maybe, you know, have a, I like some of these ideas of, you know, a, a restaurant that's more like a sports bar, like, you know, like B-dubs or, I, you know, what I have heard a lot and it wasn't mentioned in this poll is people are looking for more family restaurants and then for shopping, they want clothing that isn't, you know, high, more high end or boutique like, but not like Goodwill clothing, mm -hmm. like in the middle. So, so yeah, that's a great question, Joe. And I think, um, yeah, you're hundred percent right. I think we envision, let's just take the East side, for example. Um, we envision, yeah, having commercial development out there that supports neighborhood uh, wants, right? So maybe that is a little restaurant. Maybe it's a little convenience store. Maybe it's a, you know, who knows what it is. But if you look, you can actually go on our website and we have kind of our River North conceptual plan up and you'll see it's a mixture of single family housing, multifamily housing and commercial space to provide exactly some of those things that you suggested. And it's kind of a chicken or the egg thing, right? I think, so four years ago, we made a trip to Sheboygan. And at that time, Sheboygan was really successful in adding housing. They added, man, I mean, I don't know how many units. It was, I want to say like 2,000 units over the course of, that might be, that might be wrong. It was a lot of units. Um, and what they saw is they, the consistent four to five years of adding housing and adding people. And then what they saw is four to five years later, uh, commercial interest really spiked and that that started rolling because you know you're you want to put your business by by people um, and I think that is as we continue to get we know that housing is a need right now so if we provide space for housing we believe that it will it will be built because there's a demand for it and the more housing we get up and the more people we put on that east side I think some of that commercial stuff uh, we hope follows um, and we've already, right now we are working, we're in a development agreement with the Hoffman Development Group, who's focusing on multifamily and commercial development. So they kind of have their ties and they're talking to some of those, those individuals that might be able to make that happen. And then we're kind of working with someone else on the single family side of things um, in there. So yeah, it's, again, it's going right back to where we started the conversation in this. It was like, I know we, everyone wants to see kind of those quick, quick instant gratifications, but this type of stuff happens over the course of many years and a lot of uh, individual actions well, built up. I would think one of the first things you'd see on the east side as it pro progresses along would be something like a, a convenience store, like a quick trip, mm -hmm. something, you know, like yeah. that. Feed yeah, all right, the right. Gas, their gas and everything. I mean, that stands to reason for me anyway, before you would start getting into your Buffalo Wild Wings and Walmarts and things like that. So Yeah, that's a good point. I think, uh, Tim, I think you're probably spot on. I think we probably see it similar. I mean, you look at Quick Trip's model and how many successful they store, stores they run all over. Um, but yeah, I, I think we could see something like that out there eventually. I know it's, you know, it's just a matter of time. I think probably we've thought that for more than just the last couple of years. I think everyone's kind of driven past that area and that interchange and thought, hey, that kind of makes sense out there, right? Yeah, it does. But, uh, you know, I'm not, you know, I, I readily admit when I first got into retail, I was kind of anti-Walmart, but I've since changed my mind totally. Mm. I really think uh, we would benefit greatly, all of us from having something of that nature. I mean, it hasn't seemed to really hurt places like Monaco and things like that. Mm -hmm. So, uh, yeah, that's an interesting, that's an interesting debate. And I know it is a debate. Um, you know, typically when you do see those types of stores go up in, in relatively vacant areas, you know, you'll see a lot of things pop up around it, other development that, you know, those big anchor corporations kind of help support which is interesting too. Well, I, I think it's a good time to have some of these conversations to bring it up again, because um, just real quick, how many, how much more of the population do you expect to go up after the housing project on the east side? Um, well, again, that'll, that'll be, if it all goes as planned, uh, that'll be built out over the course of many years, right? Um, 
it's it's about 75 to 80 acres worth of uh, really vacant land that would be built on right now. So we're talking about adding, you know, streets and sewer and water. Yeah. How many people, um, you know, the first, the, right now, the first proposed project, we're looking at 120 units. Uh, so, you know, times that by two, you got a quick 240 people. Let's just say if there's an average of two people a unit, maybe there's more than that. Um, at the same time, we're looking at starting single family housing. So, it you know it's so hard to say, but if yeah. over the last couple of years, Joe, we've in the city, the population, if you compare 2019 to our latest estimate, it went from 5,900, like mid 5,900s to 6,450 something. So that gives you some idea of of what it's been lately. But then again, you know, when 2006, 2007, 2008, 2009 hit, you know, we were going ever that 15 year period in between, you know, it was going the other way. So there's so many things that as much as you want to try to um, predict the outcomes, it's there's a lot of things out of our control. And we know that housing is a demand right now and we want to work collaboratively with as many entities to try to make that. Are you looking at half percent growth a year with 1%, 2% in population? So when we look at, yeah, so a lot of our funding formulas, Tim, are based off of, are based off of that. How does our equalized value grow? How does that impact what we can do from a capital or operational standpoint? You know, we, we tend to plan conservatively. Um, so we're, we look at like a half a, or a, a percent, a 1% growth year over year from an equalized value standpoint. Um, that doesn't necessarily mean population though. Uh, that's just value within the city. So if we could continue the trajectory that we've had over the last couple of years, which is what, 400 plus people over since 2019, if you could keep that pace up, I mean, I think we think that's doable given the current market and it wasn't 400 a year though, was it? Not 400 a year, uh, 400 over the course of that time. So, you know, about 2020 to to now. Okay. Mm -hmm. And and when you grow, Tim, you know, I think it, it communities can debate if they want to grow, if they don't, if they, you know, how are they set to handle it? We feel like our infrastructure is. I mean, we have a lot of infill areas where we're not necessarily we're not expanding our borders to grow, meaning that we have to take care of extra, you know, extra miles. Um, of services, there's a lot of opportunities to build within our current borders. Plus, the reality is, is we'd be in a, a tough spot if we all of a sudden added 2,000 people next year or 3,000. You know, you grow at a certain percentage. Of yeah. yeah. But some of our like wastewater facilities and things like that, actually, they're equipped to handle quite a bit more than we have now. I mean, we're not, we feel like our infrastructure and, and everything is that's not a challenge in the in the near future so let's move on from the businesses unless there's anything else you wanted to discuss involving restaurants department stores or entertainment and sports i guess the only thing i'd say is there has been some interest in in businesses i mean you can it's kind of cool that you can see it signs went up the mexican uh, restaurant uh, that's going to be going up in the old weasels and heard from some others so um yeah i I mean, that's encouraging. Let's put it that way. Do you know an opening date for that or around what season? I don't. They'll be working in there. They're doing a lot of work, it looks like. And, and I know it's through kind of building permits. So um, it'll be a little while. Uh, yeah, I don't have, and they, they don't have a date. So <clears throat> quick on restaurants, too. I want to give a plug to Granite Cellar. It's the Danes Hall. I think people need to give that a, give that a good shot because uh, it's pretty good. So, I have eaten there. It's very uh, good. Mm -hmm. They haven't been open very long down there, but yeah, I just want to kind of give that a plug as uh, they're they're good folks, man. And yeah, absolutely. That's a, wow, it's a great what a great project, right? I mean, to restore that building, the amount of I mean, that was a great great thing to happen in our downtown. Yeah, yeah. What's the next poll question, Joe? Um, so. The next one is, what do you enjoy the most about the Wapaka area? 
Uh, 32% said Chain of Lakes King. 26% said Small Town Environment. 18.5% said Downtown Wapaka and Main Street. 9.9% uh, 9 9 for both arts, music, events, and parks and nature. And then, yeah, about 4% said all of the above. Uh, and someone said it's like it's like a Hallmark show. We'll pack I think I know who that is. I think I've heard him say that before. <laughs> uh, no, that's that sounds about right to me. Yeah, I mean that does that sounds about right to me too. Those are all great, great qualities of our town. So hard to argue any of those responses. Our next question was just uh, you know fill in the blank of what we missed. I put what else would you like to see Wapaka we'll improve on or changes Wapaka we'll should make. We, we got a lot of responses. Uh, and this is one we haven't talked about all. Uh, with technology rapidly advancing, Wapaka needs to upgrade the internet services quality and speed. Spectrum and AT&T need to be quicker like they are in other central Wisconsin communities so we can continue to prosper and grow. Uh, is this a city issue or is this a state issue? Who covers this? Yeah, so the big telecommunication companies are interesting. They each have their kind of certain areas that they provide, and they're like pretty territorial over what areas they can be in and what they can't. Um, don't have a lot of uh, say in that from a municipality standpoint. I think the only thing I will say is that now I can't speak to speed. Everyone kind of, depending on what they do, everyone needs a different level of speed. Right. I mean, if you're if you have kids that go to school uh, virtually and you also work from home virtually and you're streaming, you know, three different five different devices all day, every day, like you're probably going to need something different than what I need. Uh, but I will say from a just a general coverage standpoint, one thing that's interesting, we have a pack online, which is a, an Internet service provider. It's one of only two Internet municipal internet service utilities in the state of Wisconsin. Um, and to be honest, it, you know, it does cover city residents some, but, but just on the outskirts too, I mean, there's a lot more accessibility to internet um, and broadband due to having that in our rural areas, which is nice. Actually, they were back online, just worked with the county on a, an 11 tower project that made some uh, pretty remote areas in the county to be able to hook up, which is awesome. Is this, uh, you know, the Spectrum, AT&T, Amherst Telephone Company, uh, is this something that uh, you, you mentioned it's not a ton city related, but would this be, you know, something that a state representative uh, is in charge of or covers? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I yeah, I think it'd be appropriate. I mean, depending on what your question was or what people wanted to advocate for, I would always tell them to, to advocate through the state representatives. And if they're not the right people or they don't think that they're in conversations that can be impactful, they'll, they would, would definitely steer you in, the, those, kind of, in those right um, directions. So Joan Balwig and Kevin Peterson are those people for us. For me, just uh, from what I've heard and what I can relate to for the podcast, uh, when I go to Point, compared to when, I, when I'm in Wapaka, it is a huge difference as far mm -hmm. as getting my podcast up and going. Uh, mm -hmm. To put it on YouTube uh, in Wapaka, it takes, for an average length episode, it takes an hour and a half. In point, it takes two minutes. Really? Yeah. That's and interesting. I, it could be where I am in point because it is the university. Uh, I would assume they would have better internet than Wapaka because they're with UW and all that. But I don't know if that's something to expect out of a small town. But I imagine since there's going to be more online businesses uh, because you can do it wherever, you know, and people are loving to be in Wapaka, especially like if you can go anywhere and you don't like being in a city, then you know back is a pretty good place so i don't i don't know that's something i've noticed and i don't know if uh the stores have had issues 
at all or noticed anything, Dad? Yeah, it's, I don't know. It's not something I hear a lot of, to be honest. So I'm just curious, what is, uh, where are you when you do that? Are you at your house or are you at the store downtown or? I've tried both at our house and uh, at the stores. Okay. Huh. No, that's really interesting. I'm going to have to ask someone smarter than me in that area. I'll ask yeah, it's, guy. it's a spectrum. Well, we found that uh, with other organizations I've been with in town as well, you know, obviously, you know, Spectrum is tons, tons faster than Wapaka Online because Wapaka Online is meant to be basic, I'm, I'm guessing, you know, give people, you know, an option that don't want to don't, don't want to pay for the price of a Spectrum or an AT&T. Um, but yeah, that's, yeah. But that being said, yeah, it doesn't seem like it's as fast as it should be. And hmm. The, there's a bit of an aggravation with spectrum sometimes at least you know let's say you know once a year maybe twice even there's outages for half a day or sometimes a day and you know i know some of the businesses in town you know banks pharmacies have gone to a backup system in case that happens which i i don't know i, I think if you're going to have a service and and offer it you shouldn't have to go get a backup system. Does that make sense? I think your service should should yeah, work. It the does. Should get a heads up or some sort. But, yeah, that, that's interesting. I, I'm glad you guys mentioned that because that, like I said, it's just not something I've necessarily heard. But but it seems like, um, I mean, I I would love to dive into it and kind of research it more and see what that might be all about. Moving on so we can get some more questions in here. There's some chain of lakes questions. I don't know how much you do with King people. There's people concerned about, you know, houses being more rental houses compared to people living there. Uh, aren't, those, aren't those areas, aren't those just townships? The city doesn't really. Yeah. So. Right. So yeah, like King. King is uh, technically a little fun fact. King is only the veterans' home property. Um, what people think of as King is uh, the township of Farmington. Like if we're talking about like the Harbor Bar and that kind of stretch. Um, yeah. And yeah, so yeah, that's outside of city jurisdiction. Um, but as far as like rental, yeah, there, there's been a lot of units that have been converted to rental rentals from owner occupied to rentals. Um, that's a trend all across the country, really, right now. Um, and that'll be interesting um, to kind of see how that, that plays out. Again, we're in a weird time where interest rates have, have impacted a lot of things, too. But um, I'm just going to name off some and butt in if you want. You know, some people said more senior housing, um, affordable housing for young families. Uh, I'll, I'll talk to affordable housing really quick, Joe, and that's also a, a challenge everywhere right now as housing prices and real estate went up um, across the country. Again, that's a country issue, um, but it's also uh, individual municipality challenges. And right now, so we're working with this developer about with this 120 units HDG, 20% uh, of those units in their current financial structure would have to be affordable. Uh, as determined by WIDA, which is through the state. Uh, so we hope that we're successful in being able to put that together. Um, also, working with another developer on a straight um, WIDA project, WIDA tax credit project, and that's um, would even be, that probably result in 40 units that were uh, affordable as determined by WIDA too. And there's a scale depending on how many people uh, are in the household, uh, how much household income is affordable, so on and so forth. So um, yeah, it's, it's a huge challenge because as you guys have probably seen too, construction prices, uh, material and all of that has gone up. So even getting into what maybe used to be a $150,000 home might cost, you know, 270,000, $280,000 now. So those, those tax credit tools in Wisconsin are some of the biggest opportunities if, but they're competitive. Just moving on quick before we end. Year-round facility for multiple sports, turf surface for batting cages, walking track, pickleball, 
support sports driving indoor driving range oh wow uh for use by sports teams as well as the community um some of the older buildings should be updated on main street uh zoning made easier for nonprofits. um strawberry fest and festivals return to main street um that's a chamber of commerce that does a strawberry fest by the way so whoever said that talk to the chamber about it uh physically connecting downtown to king shopping with quaint type transit and develop a way for boaters to dock shop king more oh please refer to the trolley system in herman um Mon that might be montana um as hmm. something that encourages tourism and shopping i have heard this idea before of a way oh. to get from main street to king and a public transportation type way whether it be a trolley i've heard a bus i've heard you know th that's been a that's been an ongoing thing on and off for several years mm -hmm. um and i thought it was revisited again and maybe may even happen but i haven't heard much here recently yeah, the trolley conversation comes up a lot. It came up a lot, especially during Main Street, because we actually saw the physical tracks um, get ripped up when the road got ripped up. Mm -hmm. um, but it's kind of always been a part of those strategic conversations uh, to what level that there's been planning involved and seeing what the feasibility is. Um, I can't say there's been a lot done recently, but maybe there should be. Um, I. Joe, I, I'll tell you what, you tell me what you think of this idea. If you want, if, and I know you said you'd share that with me, which I appreciate it. I'd love to take all that, send it to kind of our um, leadership team. And maybe I can come back on if you'll have me whenever appropriate in a few months or whatever. And just like for a quick, like 10 minute, hey, thanks for all the feedback um, and the input from the community and maybe an update on, Hey, here's some things we saw and here's some progress on some of those areas, but I'll leave that up to you. Yeah. That's something we could definitely do. I know there's probably a lot of questions we didn't answer and there's probably people that wanted to do the poll, didn't get a chance. So we'll have this poll stay up. We are about to start it. Hopefully we're about to create a new public engagement committee, and this would be a perfect task for them. Um, and maybe they could use what you started to do that. So that'd be awesome. Thank you so much, Aaron, for being on uh, Pod Packa. We talked about a lot today, and we'll have to have you back to talk about more, especially as things develop with uh, future projects. And uh, uh, what's the most exciting thing that's going to happen in Wapaka this summer that everyone needs to know about? Oh, man. Um, off the top of my head, our splash pad and brand new playground at Swan Park are opening. Uh, hopefully in the, by the beginning of July or June, not July, June. Um, so that's, I mean, a, a really cool quality of life thing that would not have happened with a ton of support from grants and, uh, and uh, our private donors. So it's, that'll be exciting. Is the Swan Park project about done now then? If you go up there, I just got an email, I guess they have the signs going up today. Um, all of the Playground equipment has been delivered and is on site, but needs to be assembled. So we probably have another month and a half, but within a couple of weeks, it'll start looking close to complete. We do have some amazing parks around here. And yeah, we do. You know, South Park, Swan Park. I mean, just, yeah, they're, they're, they're very nice. They are. Agreed. A lot of good walking trails around here too. Yeah, hundred percent. Yep. Well, thank you for spending the time with us today. And thank you everyone for listening to Podpaca. And be sure to uh, rate and review our podcast, Five Stars. That helps us get out to more people. So thank you so much for listening. And thank you again, Aaron, for being on. Joe and Tim, thanks for doing what you guys do. It's cool to have the opportunity to talk.